All right, 10.30, let's fire, kick it off. Uh, New Zealand, this should actually go pretty quickly today. Uh, obviously, New Zealand's not a huge uh, area to cover. Um, so I'm thinking it'll probably be about 20 or 30 minutes. I think we have about 25 slides to get through today. Um, let's see. There we go. Here's the map. You could see separated into two distinct islands. Um, the regions of the North Island focused on Northland, Auckland, Wakato, uh, Gisborne, and Hawke's Bay. And of course, down here, Wairarapa. And then the South Bay uh, focused on Nelson, Marlborough, Canterbury, uh, Waitaki, and Central Otago. And you can see the mountain chain of the Southern Alps here on the Southern Island that sort of creates a rain shadow um, to the Eastern portion of it. <coughs> uh, general history, uh, you may have heard of James Busby and some uh, uh, research into Australia. If you looked at through the slideshow last week, uh, he planted uh, New Zealand in the late, late 1830s. Uh, it takes a long time for viticulture really to develop in New Zealand. Um, there's an Austrian viticulturalist by the name of Romeo Bergato, who was uh, sort of tasked with studying the vineyards near the turn of the century. Uh, in 1909, you see the Department of Agriculture's viticultural division completely disbanded. Um, there was a lot of uh, temperance movement in New Zealand, including a, a, a law that was enacted called the Six O'Clock Swill. Um, during World War I that stayed in place until 1967. Basically, they couldn't sell alcohol after 6 p.m. And the idea was to get, uh, get men home uh, at a reasonable hour, essentially, and keep them out of the bars. Uh, you could actually sell a, a bottle of wine in a wine shop until 1955. Um, <clears throat> restaurants couldn't sell until 60. Wineries couldn't sell a glass until 76. And those dry areas from that temperance movement uh, persisted well into the 1990s. So it's still a fairly young uh, uh, region for wine growing. Uh, Vitis vinifera arrived in the 1970s and in the 1980s. Uh, 1986, you saw a vine pole scheme to benefit that vinifera. Um, you see a lot more modern canopy management and site selection techniques that uh, come across in the 1980s and 1990s as well. Let me fix this. There we go. Um, the land under vine increased from 400 hect hectare to 37,000 hectare between 1960 and 2017. So a huge uh, jump in total wine production. Uh, but New Zealand on a whole actually commands more dollars per bottle than any other country because there's generally a lack of, of large, uh, cheap bulk wine production. Um, that has a lot to do with number one area of land available, uh, but as well as workforce available. <clears throat> Uh, we mentioned that that rain shadow earlier uh, on the South Island. You see it on the the eastern side of the Southern Alps. Uh, the North Island is less mountainous than the South Island. Um, it's a lot more rainy, uh, and in fact, Hawke's Bay is really the driest area there. <clears throat> Central Otago uh, on the South Island is a super continental climate, and it's really the only region in the country to be so because of the Southern Alps and that rain shadow that's created there. Just to give you an idea on the Winkler scale, Central Otago is a continental climate, but it is a 1A. So uh, one of the coolest growing regions that you can get. Uh, Marlborough, a little further north, is a 1B, and Hawke's Bay uh, bleeds into the, the region too. Um, it's the eastern and the southernmost growing wine region in the world. Uh, the South Island is uh, obviously the larger of the two land masses by a uh, slight amount. Um, it's divided by the Southern Alps. Um, just north of Nelson is the Tasman Bay right there. Uh, the Cook Strait actually, actually excuse me, separates the North and South Islands. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the Tukituki River and Ingaruroro, which I can never say correctly, uh, in Hawke's Bay. Uh, in Canterbury, you get the Banks Peninsula. And then the Waitaki River separates Canterbury and Central Otago. As far as soils are concerned, <clears throat> probably the most important uh, is gray wacky, uh, which is gravel. It's heavy, heavy silt, sand, and loam all in Hawke's Bay, uh, which indicates, you know, there probably is going to be some future subregions uh, within Hawke's Bay. Uh, there's shingle in the Gimblet gravels for Syrah and Bordeaux. Um, you see some sandy alluvial loam topsoil over gravel, providing really excellent drainage and limiting vine vigor in Marlboro for Sauvignon Blanc. And then in Waitaki Valley, just north of Otago, you see uh, more limestone soils. So a pretty good array of different soil types uh, throughout the country. Uh, major grape varieties that are grown in New Zealand for red, Pinot Noir obviously is king. Uh, Merlot does quite well in that Hawke's Bay and Gimlet gravel, gravel areas as well as Syrah. 
Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, of course, being uh, king of the grapes everywhere, makes its presence known as well. We'll talk about a few uh, individual producers here later on and, and speak about some of their specific examples too. Um, of course, Sauvignon Blanc from Marlboro has given a rise on a, a global scale. Uh, Montana was a massive influence with this early commercial releases in 1979, but it's really Cloudy Bay's initial vintage of 1985 that put the region on the map. Um, and interestingly enough, those of you that, uh, that have New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc on your wine lists, you'll always notice that they're the first wines of the vintage to reach, uh, reach your shelves or reach the stores, um, because obviously they're harvested in the Southern Hemisphere in you know, February, March, uh, and then a lot of times they hit uh, the same vintage, like we could be seeing 2019 Sauvignon Blancs uh, probably coming out in December. 70% um, of the country's vineyards are actually in Marlboro, oddly enough. Um, major grape varieties, though, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Riesling, and Gewürztraminer do quite well here also. Uh, mechanical harvesting is extremely common, and uh, I think we mentioned earlier a lack of labor force. Um, that's pretty much why they utilize it. Uh, but you're seeing a lot more innovation with mechanical harvesting these days that I think uh, is helping to provide better fruit. I still don't think it's as good <clears throat> as what you might see with hand-picked, um, but we're seeing technolo technological advances in it for sure. Um, again, that modern bulk wine production is difficult because of a lack of spare land and that labor force too. Um, certain styles, you are seeing some sparkling wine made in Marlboro by Kim Crawford, by Cloudy Bay, uh, by Hunters. And then the Lindauer sparkling is still the number one uh, export, which uh, is pretty interesting to note. Uh, and then, of course, Dutz famously uh, partnered with Montana in 1988. A few wine laws. All growers here actually belong to New Zealand Wine Growers, which was established in 2002. Uh, as a joint initiative of the Grape Growers Council and the New Zealand Wine Institute. Uh, the Screw Cap Initiative was pioneered in 2001. It was first used by Kim Crawford, and now it's utilized by 85% of all wines in New Zealand. Pretty uh, amazing, actually. Uh, the GI Registration Act passed in 2006 and became law in 2017. And for those of you that haven't studied New Zealand um, maybe recently, it's, it's pretty important that we go through those GIs specifically. The rules for GI here are 85% from the stated region. Uh, if it's a spirit, it has to be 100%. Um, so there's no laws governing enrichment, acidification, pruning, yields, or irrigation. Uh, and here are those GIs. So you get New Zealand as an umbrella GI. Um, you can utilize North Island as an umbrella GI, uh, South Island as well. Um, and then on the North Island, you've got Northland, Auckland, Waikato, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa that we mentioned earlier. The South Island, of course, Nelson, Marlboro, Canterbury, uh, Waitaki, and Central Otago. Uh, one of the things I might recommend is mix up your note card sets if you're studying these two different regions. Um, you know, study South Island with Washington or something like that so that you're not crisscrossing uh, whenever you get into an exam setting and, and mentioning North Island items with South Island questions. Here's a <clears throat> sort of a better picture at the North Island. Um, as best I can show you, one of the best ones I can find. Um, you can see here in Northland, uh, and it sort of, sort of shows you what grape varieties perform well here, Chardonnay, Cabernet, Merlot, um, which of course famous for Auckland. Um, that's where Cumu River is. Um, here on the east coast, you'll see Waikato, Gisborne uh, is this little sliver. And then of course, Hawke's Bay, probably the most important. Um, and then Martinborough down here in the south where you see more Pinot Noir, Sauvignon Blanc. Up, so here we go, Auckland, Kimu, and Waiheke Island are crucial. Uh, Hawke's Bay, of course, we always talk about Gimlet Gravels, but you also need to know about Bridgepaw, I think. Uh, requirements for Gimlet Gravels, uh, to be a member of the association, you have to have 95% of the defined soil characteristics. It has to have 95% come from the appellation, and it's subject to an audit if they're utilizing the Gimlet Gravels logo itself. And then, of course, there in the south, in Wairarapa is where you find Martinboro for fantastic Pinot Noirs. Uh, the first vines were planted actually in Northland in 1819. Um, it is the smallest region, produces less than 1% of the total production uh, for the entire country. Uh, Waikato is also super small production. Auckland was once probably the premier growing region, but now it accounts for less than 1% of the total production. Um, here you see a lot of moderate rainy maritime climates, and so they run into a lot of issues with both rot and frost. 
Um, Waiheke Island is sunny, dry, and warm, especially on the lower western side. Uh, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, and Wairarapa are really the bulk of the production when we talk about uh, North Island. Um, Auckland is the, uh, the wine business center for New Zealand, both Montana, uh, which is now under Pernod Ricard as Brancott Estate, and Villa Maria are based here. Uh, Hawke's Bay is the, the second largest growing region in the entire country behind Marlborough. Um, Gisborne is also known as Poverty Bay. It's planted mostly to white grapes. The first vines in the world, though, see the sun every day here, and this is where Chardonnay is sort of king. Uh, and then Wairarapa, sometimes also known as Wellington, but just for clarity here, we're going we're gonna to refer to it as Wairarapa, uh, has two subregions. It has Gladstone and then Martinborough, um, which we've mentioned a couple of times now. Here's the South Island, a little fuzzy, but uh, when it's blown up, I think it, it helps for perspective here. You could see Nelson way up here in the north, <clears throat> Marlborough here uh, on the eastern side, uh, and the Canterbury down here, um, Waitaki, and then Central Otago far in the south, and that little shadow of the Southern Alps. Um, major subregions on the South Island, from Marlborough, of course, White Rao Valley, Awateri Valley, Southern Valleys. In Canterbury, you have Waipara, and then in central Otago, you get Gibston, Wanaka, Cromwell Basin, Bannockburn, Bendigo, and Alexandra. Um, on the South Island, Nelson's the, both the sunniest and the rainiest region in all of New Zealand. It's kind of strange because of that. Um, so they do Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, uh, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay, but it contributes only 3% of New Zealand wine due to the, the land prices. Uh, Marlborough produces two-thirds of all New Zealand wine. There's actually 19,000 hectares of Sauvignon Blanc here. And Montana really controls uh, two-thirds of the vineyards. Um, so they have basically a monopoly on this thing. Uh, Canterbury was a, a rapidly growing region in the 2000s, thanks in part to Waipara, though today it's kind of fallen back to only 4% of the production. And then Central Otago. This is kind of the sweetheart. Um, it's the southernmost growing region in the world and the highest elevation in New Zealand. It actually gets up to about 380 meters here. Um, Producers from the North Island, we talked about Kumu River. Uh, these are really Burgundian styles of Chardonnay today as a, a Croatian family that dates back to the 1930s, but uh, really a year in Burgundy in 1983 changed the style of the wines. Uh, today, the different labels that they produce are Mate's, Coddington, Hunting Hill, and their estate Chardonnay. Um, and they've since purchased a site in Hawke's Bay, uh, which I look forward to, to seeing those. In Hawke's Bay, particular, um, Producers, Trinity Hill, Vidal, and Mission Estate. And Gimlet Gravels, and this one's really cool, actually, Babbage. If you guys haven't seen these, I bought a bunch of these on closeout uh, years ago for, like, single-digit prices, and they really age well. Um, we were drinking, like, O2s somewhere around 2015, and they were fantastic. Uh, Craggy Range, Esk Valley, Mission Estate, Sacred Hill, uh, and then, again, Trinity Hill and Vidal. Uh, in Wairarapa, uh, you see Adarangi, Dry River, Kasuda, and then Escarpment in that Martinborough, um, which are fantastic Pinot Noirs. Uh, on the South Island, great producers in Marlborough, Greywacky, uh, which is the same as that soil top we talked about in Hawke's Bay, uh, but I don't think you actually see that soil type in their particular production. Uh, Saracen and St. Clair. In Canterbury, you get Pegasus Bay, which are fantastic wines, Bell Hill and Pyramid Valley. And then down in Central Otago, kind of your most important uh, uh, three are Felton Road, Mount Difficulty, and Rapon. Uh, great vintages uh, throughout the 2000s, uh, 1990s, and 1990s, 1998 was great, 07 and 08 in the 2000s, and then in the 10s, we've got 10, 13, and 14. And that's my show. That's New Zealand. Any questions today? <laughs> Go Astros. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Thanks for chiming in, gang. I know it was super quick. Um, I'm going to upload this to the invitation. So you'll have the presentation to, to go through with your your staffs, or if you want to just go back over it yourself. And I'm still working on um, on developing a way to send out the recordings. I have the recordings are just big files. So if anybody has recommendations on how to best compress them, um, send me a note. All right. Cheers, gang. See you next week.